This is Module 7, Causes and Consequences of Genetic Mutations. In this video, 7-1, Introduction to Mutations in DNA Repair, I'll talk a little bit about how DNA is replicated when things are going correctly and what happens, um, what kinds of pathways are involved in correcting mutations in DNA. So because um, a lot of you in this course um, are pre-med majors and have never had molecular biology, so um, Bio 260, which all the bio majors had in their second year, I want to briefly describe how DNA is replicated when nothing bad happens so that everybody understands the consequences of when something bad does happen. And so I'm going to briefly summarize um, DNA replication, transcription, and translation. So recalling central dogma, DNA can be used as a template to make more DNA, which is a process of, of DNA replication. DNA can also be used as a template to transcribe RNA. Um, and then RNA can be used as a template to make protein using a method called translation. And so DNA to RNA to protein is referred to collectively as central dogma. The enzyme involved in replicating DNA is called DNA polymerase. Um, and it can sometimes make errors, but it can also sometimes correct its errors. RNA polymerase transcribe is the enzyme responsible for doing transcription or making RNA. And ribosomes are, are, and um, molecules called tRNAs or transfer RNAs are the two molecules responsible for translating RNA into proteins, with ribosome being the enzyme and tRNAs being the donor of amino acids. And, um, yeah. and more on that in a moment. I just want to make it very clear that when mutations occur that are permanent and affecting the organism for a long period of time, those mutations are happening in the DNA. Typically, you don't see the effect of mutations happening in the RNA, and this is because RNA is a transient molecule, meaning it is degraded quickly after it's made. And so it is possible that RNA polymerase can insert um, an incorrect base in while, while making RNA. But it's very unlikely that um, somebody would see the results of that mutation for a very long period of time. So you might make a, a bad protein or no protein at all, or malfunctioning protein, um, but it would only exist for a short period of time since these things have pretty frequent turnover in the cell. However, any change done to the DNA would be permanent. And since um, changes in the DNA are seen in the RNA and seen in the protein, and since DNA is where we store the information, if you ruin the storage, then you ruin the, or the, um, the protein for forever. Okay, so I'm going to talk about DNA replication a little bit later, but transcription is the process of using a DNA template to create RNA. And so when there is a mutation that has occurred in the DNA template, you would see that mutation also occurring um, in the complementary RNA. RNA polymerase is the enzyme that binds to the DNA and it binds to a particular regulatory region called the promoter region. Once the RNA polymerase binds to the promoter region, um, after it migrates down to the transcription start site, it will begin um, opening up and breaking the hydrogen bonds that exist between complementary base pairs in the DNA. This is called a transcription bubble. Um, the DNA is read by the RNA polymerase in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction and creates a complementary RNA strand beginning with the 5' prime end of the RNA and finishing with the 3' prime end. And so RNA is created in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction and the DNA is read to create it in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction, anti-parallel to that. The messenger RNA is therefore complementary to the bases in the DNA um, and so C's in the DNA pair with G's in the RNA, and so on. The one exception is that A's in DNA pair with uracil or U in the RNA instead of thiamine. So there's no thiamine in RNA, there's only uracil in RNA. Okay, so, oh, I forgot to mention. So if there's a mutation in the DNA, you would see a complementary mutation in the RNA. Okay, translation is the process of using a messenger RNA to um, create a polypeptide chain. The ribosome is the enzyme that does this. And a ribosome um, consists of two subunits with three different sites within it. The ribosome will recognize the translational start site 
in the messenger RNA, which is always AUG or methionine. The ribosome will then decode the codons within the messenger RNA in sets of three in order to produce a polypeptide chain. And so the ribosome will attach near the five prime end of the RNA and move towards the three prime end of the RNA. And then synthesis will begin at the AUG um, and then so an inserted of a methionine at the N terminus. And then the last amino acid will be inserted at the C terminus of the polypeptide chain by the ribosome. <clears throat> Translation is a fairly complex process and involves many different molecules. Um, there are, th uh, f I'm sorry, three major stages, initiation, elongation, which includes translocation, and termination. During initiation or the beginning of translation, the small ribosomal subunit, which is this one right here, will assemble around the messenger RNA molecule somewhere upstream of the start codon. And when I say upstream, I mean towards the five prime end, somewhere before the start codon. That's not pictured here in this image. The first transfer RNA will attach at the start codon with the small ribosomal subunit, and this is always a tRNA that carries a methionine. These are tRNAs. These are specialized um, RNA molecules that always take this clover shape that has a, an anticodon in this end that is complementary to a codon in the RNA. And then on this end, there is an amino acid that correlates and corresponds to that codon in the RNA. After the first um, tRNA enters an azomethionine at the start site, AUG, the large ribosomal subunit then attaches and then um, begins to move down towards the three prime end of the messenger RNA. Now we begin elongation, where the codon in the A site, which is here, will pair with the appropriate anticodon in the tRNA. And so the codon right here in the A site of the ribosome pairs with the anticodon in this tRNA. And this codon and anticodon pair is specific to a particular amino acid. Remember that there's redundancy in the genetic code, and so that one amino acid could be represented by multiple codon-anticodon pairs. When there is a tRNA in the A site, and then already one in the P site, at the beginning of elongation, the one that's in the P site is methionine, and then as elongation proceeds, that changes. Um, adjacent amino acids are linked together by peptide bonds between amino acids in the P site and the A site. Then translocation occurs where the ribosome moves to the next set of three and continues to assemble the growing polypeptide chain. So when a tRNA enters the A site, um, the one that's already in the A site moves to the P site, a peptide bond is made, um, and then anything that was in the P site or the empty tRNA that was in the P site moves to the E site before it um, leaves the ribosome. And then these have to be recharged and basically refilled with their appropriate amino acid. And so this will proceed until a stop codon is reached. When a stop codon is reached and it's under one of these three stop codons, UAA, UAG, or UGA, the ribosome releases the entire polypeptide and then disassembles. And so the large and small subunit will fall off the messenger RNA and then the process is done. So if there is a mutation in the DNA that then shows up in the RNA, this could change how it is being read by the ribosome and incoming TNAs during translation, which could lead to a change in amino acid. Remember that the genetic code is redundant, so one amino acid can be encoded by multiple codons. This means that any mutation in the third position of the codon where there tends to be redundancy may not actually lead to a change in amino acid. More on that in the second video. So what if something bad does happen? Typically we refer to these as mutations and most mutations are bad and cause harm to the cell. Very occasionally there are some mutations that are beneficial to the organism from an evolution and adaptation point of view. And so the basic principles of genetics were discovered by examining crosses between wild type organisms and those that carry mutations. And it's by examining these types of crosses that we were able to not only understand how mutations are inherited, but also um, the effect of those mutations on phenotype. And so how it changes the organism visually, what we can see. As I mentioned, most mutations, the far, well, actually, that's not true. So um, there, 
mutations sort of take like a normal distribution where the majority of the mutations, say about 50% of the mutations, are harmless, actually do no damage to the cell whatsoever. And many of us today are carrying these types of mutations where there was a change from between us and our parents, but we don't actually see any effect of that mutation. 25% of mutations tend to be, or is, I guess it's really more like, okay, so like 80% of mutations are neutral and basically have no effect. About 10% of mutations are harmful, meaning they cause um, a defect in the organism and are the source of many inherited diseases. And the remaining 10%, I'm sort of making these up, I'm just trying to follow a normal distribution, but the remaining 10% of mutations are actually the sustainer of evolution and the source of adaptive mutations for um, evolving populations. And so basically what this means is, remember that genetic material has to have the capacity to vary. That's one of the four requirements for genetic material. This can, and also needs to have the capacity to be faithfully replicated. And so there's a dichotomy here, right? Those things are, those are opposed to each other. So we need to be able to retain our genetic information and replicate DNA faithfully so that we don't have um, uh, mutations popping up causing inheritable diseases. But if DNA never mutated and never changed and was the same from generation to generation, there would be no adaptation either because there would be no beneficial mutation to select for in favor of over the wild type. And so mutations are also the sustainer of adaptation. Genetic dissection studies are used typically with bacteria, but also with some eukaryotes to understand gene function. And what this means is if we wanna know um, if what a particular gene does, the best way to do that is to, dis, um, is to ruin it or break it. And so introduce mutations in a particular gene and then look to see what types of phenotypes are changed as a consequence of that mutation. And so many of the um, gene functions that we know in the human genome these days are either ones where we've identified a mutation in somebody who carries a genetic disorder. Um, and so we know that now what that gene does because we know what happens when it breaks. We also can get at this using bacteria where we do what's called knockout studies and destroy a gene in bacteria to determine what happens, what consequence there is when that gene is broken. And so these are called genetic dissection studies. So these types of mutations can be classified in different ways, and we'll talk about the specific types of mutations that can occur in video 7-2. But let's say a mutation does occur. So what happens? What, how can we repair these mutations? Mutation rates are low. It's about less than one error per billion nucleotides. And the reason why mutation rates are low is because we have many cellular pathways that actually repair defects in DNA before they have a chance to become permanent. In order for DNA repair mechanisms to work, two, two, it requires two nucleotide strands, so one old template strand and one that contains the mutation. This way, the old template strand can be used to repair the other strand that contains the defect by first removing the defect and then using the old template strand to replicate and complement in, in the new strand. So basically use the old strand to make a new, um, to make a new strand after you've removed the mutation. Um, another requirement for DNA repair um, mechanisms is that there needs to be redundancy since um, it is possible that one of these pathways could fail, but thankfully you have another pathway that can sort of pick up, pick up the slack. And so damage can be corrected by more than one pathway of repair. And so if your base excision repair doesn't work, um, you've got three other different types of DNA repair mechanisms that can maybe pick up the slack. So you can have a little bit of defect in some of these mechanisms because there's so many redundant mechanisms for repairing DNA. Before we talk about these types of DNA repair mechanisms, it's important to note that DNA polymerase itself, the enzyme that replicates DNA, uses DNA as a template to create DNA, actually has the ability to correct its errors. DNA polymerase can recognize when it inserts an incorrect base before repeated rounds of DNA replication make the error permanent. And so if this error can be caught before the DNA is replicated a second time, then the, then the mutation will not occur. So this is basically the process of how this works. DNA polymerase um, has two different active sites. 
um, one where, I'm sorry, this one, one where we're inserting a DNA nucleotide and creating a phosphodiester bond, and one where we are removing a nucleotide and breaking a phosphodiester bond. And so it's a bifunctional enzyme with two different active sites. When DNA polymerase binds to a DNA molecule and starts adding complementary sites, it does so in the polymerase active site, this blue region. If an incorrect base has been inserted, as is shown here, where C is being paired with A, and that is not um, normal Watson and Crick base pairing, the DNA polymerase will backtrack one by one base, move backwards by a single base, and so this incorrect match will now enter the proofreading site. Um, a three prime to five prime exonuclease activity, meaning it's now able to backtrack and go in the opposite direction that it would normally go. So it normally goes five prime to three prime to make DNA, but it will backtrack and go three prime to five prime to correct DNA problems. And exonuclease means that it breaks a phosphodiester bond, pulling out the incorrect base. Then when it resumes it's five prime to three prime direction, this same base will enter the polymerase active site, the correct base will be inserted and replication will continue. And so many errors are caught just by the enzyme that is um, doing the error in the first place. But sometimes DNA polymerase, because it is working very quickly, can miss when it has inserted an incorrect base. And since it can only move back by one base, once it has moved beyond the incorrect base by say three or four others, um, it can no longer have the ability to correct its error. And so other mechanisms have to be in place to recognize errors when they're made um, and then repair them. One of these systems is called mismatch repair, where the mismatch repair system of, of proteins will recognize errors as a defect in DNA structure, cut them out, fill in the gap, and repair the cut. The major players involved in this system are methyl groups in bacteria, um, it's not totally known, or it's not necessarily required for eukaryotes, but it is required for bacteria. Mismatch repair complex, which is a complex of proteins that helps to bind to the error um, and create um, a cut in the, um, the mutated strand. The, an exonuclease, which is an enzyme um, that will remove nucleotides on the new strand where the error has occurred. DNA polymerase, which will come in and bind and fill in the gap um, and add new bases, and DNA ligase, which will make the final phosphodiester bond and repair the entire DNA strand. And so first, in mismatch repair, we've got a, um, a G being paired with a T. This is not proper Watson and Crick base pairing. Remember that G will make three hydrogen bonds with its pair, T only makes two. And because, and this also, um, remember that these are two different types, or I'm um, um, sorry, these are the same type of nucleotide. Okay, and so when this happens, um, there is a bubble that forms in um, the DNA. So this is particularly true if two purines um, connect to each other. So remember that the um, the two two purines are going to have uh, so a purine has a double or uh, two rings, two nitrogenous rings in it, um, and two of the four deoxyribonucleotides, so adenosine and guadenine, um, are uh, pyrimidines. I'm sorry, purines. <laughs> sorry. Um, two nucleotides that have two rings are going to cause a, a, a bubble in the DNA backbone because normally it's a one ring structure pyrimidine pairing with a two ring structure purine. When you have two two ring structures or two single ring structures, you will alter the shape of the DNA double helix. And this is typically how DNA repair mechanisms recognize errors once they are made as a defect in the structure of the backbone. So this defect is recognized um, by the mismatch repair complex, where the mismatch repair complex will, will um, bind to the incorrect base and will also bind to um, the previously methylated old template DNA. And so the old strand has methyl groups attached to it. The new strand hasn't existed long enough for methyl groups to be attached to it. And so in bacteria, this is how the old and new strands are distinguished from each other. 
The old strand is methylated from ages ago, and the new strand has not yet been methylated because it's brand new. There just hasn't been time. In eukaryotes, we don't actually know how old and new strands are distinguished, but they are somehow still being worked out by research. Okay, and so the mismatch repair complex will bring the mismatch base close to a methylated sequence, specific sequence the G, um, of GATC in a row. And so the new strand is identified as the unmethylated one. Then an exonuclease will create a cut in the phosphodiester backbone and remove all of the nucleotides on the new strand between this GATC sequence and the, and the mismatch. And so this entire string of DNA is removed. DNA polymerase will then bind to the open three prime end here and then fill in the gap all the way in this direction until the last phosphodiester bond, which is made by DNA ligase. And then we repair the problem. Another type of DNA repair, which specifically helps to fix um, errors caused by UV light is called direct repair. Um, UV light will actually cause <clears throat> defects in, um, per, um, in pyrimidines called pyrimidine dimers, where adjacent pyrimidines that are next to each other on the same strand will form a bond together. Um, enzymes um, that are involved in what's called direct repair can, can fix these problems. And so rather than remove an entire section of DNA, we just fix the, pro um, we just fix the bases that are experiencing the problem. So for example, UV light will induce what's called a pyrimidine dimer, which is what I was just talking about, where two pyrimidines that are adjacent to each other on the same string will form um, bonds together. And so that makes it so that they can't form um, hydrogen bonds with their complements on the opposite strand. An enzyme called photolyase in bacteria breaks these bonds that links the two adjacent dimers, allowing them to form Norman Wa normal Watson-Crick base pairing with the two DNA strands. And so photolyase is a DNA repair enzyme in bacteria. Eukaryotic enzy enzymes can experience these types of mutations too. And so there's, a, there's an enzyme in eukaryotes that does something similar to photolyase. But also eukaryotic, um, there's another type of alteration to bases um, called acetylation where um, um, they're, um, uh, the base, the existing base is um, mutated in some way to contain an extra functional group. And so, for example, guanine can be methylated to form O-methylguanine. Um, and so, oh, I think I said acetylation, I meant alkylation, my mistake, I'm sorry. Um, and so alkylation chemicals can add methyl groups to guanine, which alters how guanine will base pair. Um, and I'll talk more about that in the third video. This enzyme called methyltransferase will recognize this, pull this methyl group off, and restore guanine to its original form. And so methyltransferase is a DNA repair enzyme, or direct repair enzyme, sorry, in eukaryotes. So again, we're not removing bases and then filling them back in. We're just correcting the altered base and leaving it as is. Base excision repair works similar to mismatch repair, where an error is recognized and then removed. Um, and then filled in. And so here we are, um, so here we're looking at uh, a damaged base. And so it's not that a mistake was inserted like mismatch repair. It's more like a, a base has been damaged by some type of mutation um, agent. And so a damaged base can be removed and repaired um, by base excision repair. And so this is something similar this is similar to direct repair, only in direct repair, we fix the problem by altering the base back to its original form. In base excision repair, we just pull it out. We pull out the, the incorrect base and then add in a new base. Here the major players are DNA glycosylase, um, an apurinic um, site, an endonuclease, a DNA polymerase, and a DNA ligase. So let's go through this step by step. Okay, um, here we have a damaged base where the backbone, this is the DNA backbone here, the phosphodiester backbone. We have the ribose sugar and then the nitrogenous base, which is damaged in some way. An enzyme called DNA glycosylase, which is a base, base excision repair enzyme, 
will pull off just the nitrogen base of this nucleotide, leaving the backbone intact. Um, this now generates what's called an AP site, or an apurinic or an apyrimidinic site, depending on which type of, of um, base was removed. So if a purine was removed, um, it's an apurinic site. If a pyrimidine was removed, it's an apyrimidinic site. Um, a special type of endonuclease, which is able to recognize and cle uh, recognize an error, um, an AP site in the center of a strand, it can recognize this bind and break the phosphodiester bond on either side of this site. And this will remove the deoxyribose sugar that has nothing attached to it. We then will use DNA polymerase, which recognizes this open three prime end and inserts a new nucleotide. And then DNA ligase will repair the last nick in the sugar phosphate backbone by um, making that last phosphodiester bond. The last type of DNA repair that I'm going to talk about is nucle oops, nucleotide excision repair. Nucleotide excision repair moves these bulky DNA lesions that tend to distort the double helix, so similar to mismatch repair. But these are really big um, distortions of the helix, so typically more than one base that's been added. Um, this system is found in all cells of all organisms, and so every cell is capable of nucleotide excision repair. The major players involved are the enzyme complex, and there's many different types in humans alone, and so they're just collectively referred to as nucleotide excision enzyme complex, DNA polymerase, and DNA ligase. Here, damage to the DNA is distorting the double helix. So again, it's like maybe two purines linked together or two pur pyrimidines linked together, and that's going to cause a distortion in the double helix. This enzyme complex will recognize the distortion and create a replication bubble where it opens up the, the double-stranded DNA, breaking hydrogen bonds that exist between them. Single-stranded binding proteins will then bind to each of these single strands, keeping this fork open, so keeping this bubble open and preventing it from just snapping immediately back closed again. The enzyme will cleave and break phosphodiester bonds on either side of the distortion and remove all of it, including the single-stranded binding proteins, leaving a gap. DNA polymerase will then bind to the open 3' prime end, fill in the gap, and then DNA ligase will seal the last phosphodiester bond.